Maybe Pires. you could elaborate a little bit on the basic concept of the Kabbalah to the people that really don't have the real meaning and definition. But what is the Kabbalah basically? Okay. You're assuming that everybody knows. I okay. Might have Different definition. I'd like to hear it from you. Um, maybe Evgen wants to comment, uh, give an overview. Yeah. So actually, it was stated at the very beginning of this uh, talk that Kabbalah defines defines uh, concepts or spiritual entities which reflect creation, the creative process, how God created the world and also how God reveals himself to us through the world, how we work ourselves back from great plurality, because our experience is an experience of the, of the plural, of the many, how we're able to return in our consciousness to unity. These ten feet are, are it's a two-way street. It's a street from unity to plurality, but more important for us, it's the ability to return from a consciousness of plurality to unity. Now unity itself has two different dimensions to it, which maybe will be explained in the continuation. We've used the word here several times, we've heard the word harmony. Harmony means that everything works well together, that everything is balanced in a state of equilibrium, just like the example that was mentioned a moment before. But if you have too much of the left, too much uh, severity, and too little kindness, so then you're out of balance. And if you're out of balance, then there's no shalom, no peace, because the word peace means completeness, harm, shalem, shleimut. If there's no peace, as we said in our previous talk, there's no vessel, there's no complete vessel to receive blessing. Right? So there's an important concept, which is harmony. Harmony is called the lower unity the lower concept of unity, that, that, that everything is working together in perfect harmony, just like when you hear a musical work, if everything, if all of the uh, instruments are playing in harmony, so then you hear one beautiful sound. But actually in that one beautiful sound that you're hearing, there are many, many different notes that are being played simultaneously. That is called the lower unity. The higher unity, which is reserved especially for, for the Jewish soul, is that absolutely all is, is, is truly one, is absolutely one. That God is all, all is God, all is one. This level of unity, which is called the the higher unity, can only be reached from below by going through the lower unity. In a certain way, the lower unity is the vessel the sense of harmony or the creating of a situation of harmony which is based upon these ten spherot, the structure of the ten spherot, whether it's in the body or in the soul or in a company or in any other phenomenon of the world, that is a vessel or that harmony which is the lower unity is a vessel to be able to bring down the light and the awareness of the absolute higher unity of all. Now, just one more remark to, to uh, give a little bit of insight on what, what we just heard, this talk. The, just like any other uh, concept in the Torah, to understand the deep meaning of something, one first meditates upon the, the root of the word, the meaning of the word in the Hebrew language. Because the Hebrew language is also the vessel, or the channels, the letters in the words are the channels through which God creates the world. This is the basic thought and teaching of the Kabbalah. So if we take this very word itself, Kabbalah, and uh, think, meditate upon the word, it's the simple meaning that we all, uh, whoever knows a little bit of Hebrew, will say is that it means to receive, that it's a wisdom that is received generation from generation, from from mipelepe, uh, from mouth to mouth. But the original meaning the first meaning in the Tanakh, in the Bible, of this root Kabel, the Kabel, as actually you find in this week's Torah portion of Truma, is the expression Makbilot Halulaot, that Makbil in Hebrew means parallel, or in direct one-to-one -one correspondence. Meaning, and this is what we're taught, that the, the teaching of the Kabbalah as we mentioned at the beginning of our first talk, that everything depends upon 
upon rectification of thought processes is to be able to recognize in reality the proper correspondences of different sets. Because if I have a set here of one of, uh, say, five objects, and another set which at first appearance, Bashkafar Rishona has no relationship whatsoever to the first set, but it also just happens, as it were, to possess five elements. So there must be, what Kabbalah says, is that I must be able to line them up. It's like what's called American testing. I must be able to have, to have that wisdom, this is called the wisdom of Kabbalah, to draw the lines from one set to the other set to see that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. But this talent or sense is that sense which is developed by the study of Kabbalah. Now, whenever, in order to develop this ability to see one-to-one -one correspondence between sets of identical numbers of elements, one has to have basic frames of reference. So the Kabbalah presents, this is also God-given, the two most basic frames of reference are the four letters of the divine name, Yudke Vavke, is the most basic frame of reference, that those four letters correspond to the four worlds and to other things that we'll mention in the continuation. And what we've just heard, the structure or the stature, the complete stature of ten sfirot. That when these ten sfirot are expanded, it's either 11 or 13, 13 inner experiences that go along with the, that correspond to the ten sfirot. So once what this serves as the basic frame of reference, or the basic prism through which all of reality is to be perceived. This is the wisdom of Kabbalah. Again, what is it good for? It's good for creating a lower unity, which is a balance, a harmony, which itself serves as the vessel to experience the higher unity of God being absolutely one and all being God and God being all. So this is, the, this, is, this is the wisdom, this is the inner soul of the Torah. The Torah was given body and soul. The body are the 613 commandments with all of their meanings. And the soul is the wisdom of the Kabbalah, which is the ability to, to search for and to reach awareness of the divine. And so that's, How yeah. is it related to Hasidut? Right, so here we had two sets of concepts. One set of concepts was the names of the Svirot. Then there was another set of concepts that was presented along with it, which are the inner experiences that go along with those Svirot. The inner experiences, let's take the example that was mentioned here, the example of wisdom. So wisdom is a flash, a lightning, a new insight. How was wisdom explained? Wisdom is insight. The interinclusion of understanding in wisdom, as we were taught that everything has in, possesses the property of interinclusion, that's called intuition. Another very important thing that we'll have to talk about, especially when we talk about decision, decision making. So there's cognitive, there are two levels of decision making. There's a cognitive, more analytic decision making process. There's more intuitive decision making process. Right, so intuition, intuition is a very important uh, concept, especially in our world. And insight is also, insight is usually a scientist, as we said, will have the insight, a new spark of a new idea how to create a new project, a new uh, product. Intuition is usually the, uh, say in the business world, how to create a, a new corporation or a new, uh, a new way of, of, uh, of, pr of producing or selling, of advertising, whatever it happens to be. The concept of insight or even intuition, this is more or less a direct, uh, a direct translation of the word chokhmah, which is the term in Kabbalah. If I say that in order to receive that insight or that intuition, I myself have to be in a state of selflessness, Actually, the way that, uh, that uh, Professor Karashat explained it, he explained that a moment, if you remember, a moment after insight, a person can sense 
like the flesh, if he doesn't catch the flesh, the flesh can vanish, and then he's left with nothing. But even more explained in the Hasidut, in order to receive a flesh, or the very moment that one is experiencing that flesh, a person does not experience himself. You can't experience in true insight or a true moment of intuition and be thinking about yourself at the same time. As it says, En anivu hu yucholim nador biyachad. I, I means a God-given idea. A new insight is like a gift or a, a revelation of God. It says that I, God, and you means your ego cannot be experienced simultaneously. So a person is getting a new flash of insight at that moment, he is in a state of selflessness, meaning that a person that has the nature of being selfless, self, now once more here also, if we would have to explain Hasidut, but you're asking what does Hasidut add, Hasidut teaches me that in order to receive insight or intuition, I have to be in a state of bitul, of selflessness. Now, if you look, say, in the chart, you'll see that, that at the very last level is called malchut, which the inner experience of malchut is shiflut. Here it's translated as humility. Humility is not selflessness. Selflessness is chokhmah, and humility is here malchut. So actually, this very concept of, of rectifying one's ego, if we would do this properly, this would be the, maybe the most classic example of what Hasidut emphasizes, it emphasizes actually four different levels. From selflessness means not just not being there, not experiencing myself at all, or anava, that's called bitu, bitul. The next level is called anava, which is usually also the, there are not enough English words to translate all of these terms. Anava is also usually translated as humility. Anava means that a person does a lot and he knows what he's done. He's learned a lot, or he's achieved a lot in his life. He's been successful in business. He does lo machzik tovali atzmo, is the expression in Hebrew. He doesn't take the credit to himself. He gives the credit to who deserves the credit, which is to the Ribbono Shu'alam, to God. That's called anava, that you do a lot, and you're very successful, and you're not egocentric about it, and you're not arrogant about it. You don't take the credit to yourself. That's called anava. That's one level below bitul, below selflessness. Then a level below that is called hachna'a, a word that we used before on our first speech. That hachna'a means submission or surrender. That I know that I have my inclinations, my yitzarim, and I know that God has commanded me such and such. I have to subdue and surrender myself in face of the will of God of the Almighty. That consciousness of surrender of my own wills and my own passions, which are not God-motivated, to do God's will, that is called hachna'ah. Hachna'ah's submission or surrender. Then comes shiflut. Shiflut is what here is attributed to malchut. The shiflut, actually, the real translation, here we've done humility because the real translation in English is, can have a negative meaning. The real translation of shiflut is not humility, it's actually lowliness. To feel lowly. What does lowliness mean? Lowliness means that I feel how distant I am from God. I feel, my, I feel myself completely in how far I am from God, and that experience of being far away from God is actually not intended to make me fall into depression or despair, God forbid, but just the opposite, to motivate me to come closer to do tshuva. That's why it has to do with malchut. Malchut is David HaMelech. David HaMelech is the pillar of tshuva. Who, who is about tshuva? A person who first experiences Lord, or always feels how far I am from God, I want to come closer. Once more, this, this is a classic, this what we just now said in short, is a classic uh, description of a Hasidic meditation. What Hasidus adds to the terminology of Kabbalah. Because it's talking about the inner experience of the human being going through the Svirot. In other words, Bitul is the inner experience of Chochmah. Anava, which is not taking the credit for myself, but giving the credit to who is due credit, that goes together with the Simcha, with the joy of understanding, it says. Hachna'a, submission and surrender, 
That goes together with the tamimut, the sincerity of hod, of thanksgiving. And shiflut, lowliness, is the inner experience of a true rectified kingdom. So once more, this, this is exactly what was explained, that there are spirot with their psychological meanings, like an insight. And then Hasidut comes and teaches you what is the human experience that belongs to that. Right now we're going to look at two uh, charts. <coughs> We now have in front of us a relatively simple chart that only has four levels to it. As we said before, before our break for lunch, there are two basic frames of reference in the Kabbalah, either the more complete frame of reference, which is called the Ten Sfirot, that were presented before, or the even more kernel presentation of all of the levels of the soul and of the world which correspond to the four letters of God's holy name. The four letter name of Yudke Vavke. Those four letters themselves when combined or made parallel to the Sfirot, the Yud is Wisdom is father. The first he is understanding mother. The vav corresponds to all of the six levels, the emotions, the three basic emotions, and the other three innate emotions. Sometimes they're called all six emotions, but three are actually emotive and experienced in the heart, and the other are more behavioristic. By innate, we may mean something that expresses itself as, be, as behavior patterns, behaviorism. Those are the three netzachod, yesod, that were discussed before. All six together correspond to the vav of Hashem's name, which is the son, the son of the, of the father and the mother. Sometimes the son himself becomes six sons, just as we find by the matriarch Le'ai Meno, she had six sons and one daughter, Dina. So that's a direct correspondence in Kabbalah to the six levels of the heart, the three more emotive and the three more innate. And the final one, which is Mahut, kingdom, is the daughter. So actually all of Kabbalah is based upon a family. With any complete manifestation is a family of Father, mother, son, daughter. The son possesses six different facets to him. But it's basically one kernel concept. In Kabbalah it's called one point. Because all of the six levels of the heart derive from one point. Mahut is a point in itself. Wisdom is a point in itself. Understanding is a point in itself. There are four points. Then the cat or the crown is another point. I mean, all together there are five points, this is a concept in Kabbalah, which are the four letters of Hashem's name, Yud Kei plus the Kotso Shal Yud, the crown above the Yud of Hashem's name, that corresponds to the Svira of crown, which as was explained before, itself has three dimensions to it, of faith and pleasure and will. <coughs> Alright, so now we have a form here, which is called we've called it in English the four conditions of leadership or in our program that was passed out it's called the prerequisites, four prerequisites of executives and this <coughs> is a verse in the Torah, a verse that we read exactly one week ago on Shabbat, Parashat Yitro so it has to do with the time, our time now of the Torah reading so just let's discuss a moment the background of this, where this verse comes from, where these conditions are related to us. 
We know that Jethro, Yitro is Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, of Moshe Rabbeinu. He was a priest of all of the different various forms of idolatry that then existed around the world. The, our sages teach us that there was no religion and no idolatry that he did not, uh, was not an expert and, a, uh, and, uh, and practicer of, and a priest of. He knew all what was then called, he could open up a university of comparative religions. All of the religions in the, in the world. This was Yitro Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. The Torah portion of last week begins by Ishma Yitro, that he heard, when he heard of all the wonders and miracles surrounding the Exodus and the splitting of the Red Sea and the, the war against Amalek and all the other miracles that happened, he came to the realization and understanding that only the God of Israel and the God of his son-in-law son Moses is the true God and the true way. And he came with, he brought Moses, his wife and two children who had returned to him when Moses went to Egypt. And he brought them to the desert and he converted. But he went through conversion, just very similar to what we were talking about uh, a while ago about Eliezer Eved Abraham. He converted himself and he was the first person in the whole Bible to say explicitly, Baruch Hashem, blessed be God. He said that the whole Jewish people, nobody dreamt of saying Baruch Hashem until Yitro came and he said Baruch Hashem. And as soon as he said the words, Baruch Hashem, blessed be God, then the Torah was able to be given to the whole Jewish people. And the Torah, that's why this is the portion of the Torah being given to Israel. It all depends upon Yitro coming and recognizing with full recognition that there is only one God, who is the God of Israel. And he says, Baruch Hashem, Ata Yadati Ki Gadol, Hashem Elohim. Now I know, I firmly know and recognize that there is only one great God who is the God of the Jewish people. Right, then, what happens afterwards? Afterwards, he finds, the Torah goes, goes on to relate that he finds that Moshe Rabbeinu Moses is having difficulty. He's sitting alone, and he's judging the people from morning to evening. And the people are standing over him, waiting in line. There's hundreds, maybe thousands of people waiting in line to be judged by Moses. There's something wrong with the organization. He senses that, that it's not working properly. There's too much weight being placed upon Moses, which is bad for the people and bad for him, bad for Moses. And he won't be able to, to take it forever. He'll disintegrate. Moses himself will not be able to handle this severely weighty situation. So how can we release him from all of that weight, all of that COVID? So Yitro comes up with a brilliant idea. And his brilliant idea is what we are now going to speak of, which is one of the most important topics of, uh, of today. As all of the topics, I'm, I hope that it's clear to everyone that we're only trying to give a small, small taste of things which would, which would require a long, long time, many, many sessions to, uh, to delve into deeply. Yitro presented an organizational pattern and structure which nowadays in modern economical terminology is called flat hierarchy. The flat hierarchy means is that there is someone on the top, let's call it the pyramid of the organization, but that responsibility is given Full responsibility is given to people, to officers and ministers that are much lower in the pyramidical, hierarchical structure of the organization. That the person in charge, the boss, the manager, he is the source and origin of inspiration. He is the one that makes the basic big decisions. He is the one that converses and relates directly to God and receives the word of God and teaches it to the people. But much of the responsibility is handed down to lower degrees in the hierarchical 
structure of the organization. And Yitro says that only in this way will it, will it work. Will it work for a great people that Amir Hashem, God willing, the people will become greater and greater, means the company, the, co the corporation will become greater and greater and greater, and still the system will, be, will remain stable and complete. Now, here Yitro says two different things to Moshe Rabbeinu. Yitro was a very wise man. And this wisdom he got, this is, a, this is one of the classic, maybe the most important example in the whole Torah, that Chochmah Bagoyim Ta'amin. As he came with this wisdom, he expressed it actually after he converted. But obviously it was coming from all of his experience. Ein Chacham Kibbal on all of his experience as a non-Jew, as a priest, to Aveda Zorah, to idolatry. Nonetheless, he had all of this wisdom, which is true wisdom. But from him we learn the principle, Chochmah Bagoyim Ta'amin, and actually our own Torah is not given to us until Moses listens to him. Vayishma Moshe, first the parasha begins that he, Yitro, heard of the miracles of the Exodus. But after he was he gave this advice to Moses, to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe took his counsel, listened to him, and applied his teachings. Chokhmah Bagoim Ta'amin. Now actually we're taught in Kabbalah and Chassidut that Yitro himself, in all of his wisdom, that Mo Moses, the greatest prophet of Israel, received it and listened to him and did what he taught him, he did not fathom how deep and how meaningful were the very words that he, that he expressed. As he certainly understood the wisdom of his system to a certain level, to a certain extent, but how deep it goes. Only when Moses heard it from him did Moses pick up, understand how deep is this advice that he throw my father-in-law, again, who is reiterating it from his own sources, how deep this advice goes. And that's why he said he listened into the penimut of the advice. He did exactly what he was told to do, what Yitro told him to do. Now, Yitro told him two things. He told him about, again, what nowadays is called flat hierarchy. Another way to, to uh, to uh, coin an expression. If we're talking not just about a company, about a business organization, but we're talking about a government, a whole governing organ of a whole people, Ken Yerbu, that will become greater and greater at end so. So we know that, that there are two uh, basic philosophies, political philosophies of uh, government. One is monarchy, and then in the last few hundred years, we have another system which is called democracy. Both of these systems, each one by itself, is insufficient, which again, right now is not the time to explain. By flat hierarchy, we can coin another very interesting sounding expression, democratic, democratic monarchy. Democratic monarchy. Something new, nobody ever heard of this expression before. But this is exactly what Yitro was, pro Yitro was proposing, is proposing to the Jewish people. That a king, a monarchy, but something that is sprouting from the people. And that leadership with responsibility, as responsible leadership, judges, sarei asarot, sarei mechameshim, sarei meot, sarei alafim, sprouting from below. There's something very, very democratic about the monarchy. So once more, in our present world, we don't have this at all. Is this wisdom of Parashat Yitro, which once more, this is the introduction to the giving of the Torah to, to Israel. Meaning that this is the system which is the vessel for the Torah to work, to operate at a national level the level of a people, a people whose intention is to be a light and a source of inspiration 
and teaching to the whole world. All right, now in addition to presenting this, his system, which we'll go on to explain a little bit, he said to Moshe Rabbeinu that you have to go and with your Ruach HaKodesh, with your deep insight and prophetic insight, you have to see the Atat Techezeh, is the way the famous verse begins. You have to see in the people who has these four properties. Who possesses amongst the people these four conditions that are written here on the chart, in this order. Find, and he says, see, the Atat Techezeh is very important. We all probably have heard that the most important classic of the Kabbalah is the Sefer Azor, the Book of Brilliance of Rashbi. Here on this verse of Atat HaChezeh is one of the longest and involved sections in the Zohar which is called Chokhmat HaParzuf. Chokhmat HaParzuf is how to look at a person and see by the different qualities of his facial expressions, his hairs and his forehead and his eyes and his nose and his lips and his hands to be able to understand his personality and to be able to identify and recognize if he possesses these properties. So once more, all of the wisdom of recognizing a person's personality and characteristics by his face and all of the other limbs of his body, this is called, this is from the verse, Vatat that you have to look, check, one after one of the people and find those people that have these four properties. And these are the leaders. Once more, and these are the people that you have to give the responsibility to. They are the judges, they are the decision makers at the lower level. Only when they do not know how to make the decision, then it goes up to a higher level. But once more, this is nowadays what's called flat hierarchy or what we have now coined a new expression, democratic monarchy. All right, now, before we continue, let's say another few words about the uh, Yitro. In Kabbalah we know, and we actually mentioned before, that there is a concept called reincarnation of souls. That souls pass through different stages of rectification. And when the soul is rectified one level, one dimension, then it comes back another time, another lifetime, in order to rectify another dimension. A very, one of the most important things that the Kabbalah teaches about Yitro, the father-in-law of Moses, in relation to his son-in-law Moses, that says that this is a reappearance of Cain and Abel. The two sons of Adam HaRishon, we know the first two sons that were born together, are Cain and Abel, Cain and Hebel. And we all know the story that Cain killed his brother Hevel. Why did he kill him? Aureka Iski. Everything uh, nowadays in Israel, Rahman Ali San Hashem Irachem, when somebody is, when there's some, uh, some pigua, some, uh, some murder. Hashem Yirachem, so they always try to get out of it and say that it was on, on, on a political background or some, or some other background or some other background. So one type of background is called a uh, financial background, for financial reasons. So the first murder was a financial murder. The murder that Cain killed Abel. Because who is to possess the world? It was fighting over the possession of the world. This is the simple, the simple reading of the Torah. It's just that Chazal teach us that there was another deeper element, another deeper reka. It wasn't just a reka iski. It was also, reka means background. This is the idiom that's used very frequently now, in, especially in, in Israel. It was also a reka ishut on a marital background. What does that mean? As I'll say that we learn from the Torah when we read the beginning of the Torah, when Cain and Abel were born, 
to Adam and Chava, the firstborn was Cain, Cain. And when he was born, it says, Et Cain, Et Cain. And the word Et is a word, a small word, that's used in Hebrew to precede an object of a sentence. But Chazal teaches, our sages teach that this word always comes to, to include something more. It's not explicitly stated in, this, in the text. So from that word, et kayin, bal rabot tohmat, comes to, to, to include that together with kayin was born a sister, a twin sister, one twin sister. How do we know that, that she had to have a twin sister born simultaneously together with him? Because who was he to marry? There were no uh, women around. This was the beginning of creation. Our sages teach us that the, that Cain, as well as Abel, had to marry their sisters. But the Torah doesn't say that they had sisters. So where were the sisters, where were the sisters hinted at? And it's more about this, as Olam Chesed Yibaneh. Later on, when the Torah itself comes and forbids us to marry siblings, for brother and sister to marry, it says, Ki Chesedu. This goes together with what was taught before. Too much kindness, too much love. Love without restraint can be a bad, a negative thing. When the Torah forbids marrying one sister, it says, Ki chesedhu. It's too much kindness, kindness. Infinite, infinite love, too much. It's shame. Sometimes the word kindness means shame. But Chazal say about that, why does it say that marrying one sister is chesed? Because at the beginning of creation, there was only one sister to marry. And it says, Olam chesed yibaneh, Hashem built and rectified the world with chesed, with kindness, by permitting and making both Cain and Hevel marry their own sisters. So once more, Cain was born with a twin sister whom he married. When it speaks thereafter, one verse thereafter, of Hevel being born, directly after Cain, it says, et achiv et Hevel. That word et, which implies a twin sister, is repeated twice. So Chazal say that Hevel was born with two twin sisters. Cain was born with only one twin sister. Hevel was born with two twin sisters, meaning that he had two potential wives to be, whereas Cain only had one. So what evolved from that? Evolved a jealousy trip. That Cain, this is what Chazal say, Cain entered into a jealousy trip, that he was jealous of the fact that his brother Hevel, his younger brother, had two twin sisters, whereas he only had one twin sister. And this was the deeper Rekha, a Rekha Ishut, that he killed his brother in order to marry that extra twin sister. So once more, the simple reason that he killed his brother was financial, possession. And the deeper reason was marital, or jealousy over a woman. How did Yitro rectify? Once more, Moshe Rabbeinu in Kabbalah, the Arizal says that Moshe Rabbeinu is Hevel, back alive on the scene. And Yitro, his father-in-law, is Cain, back alive. How does now Yitro rectify his killing? In other words, Yitro killed Moshe Rabbeinu in the previous reincarnation, the previous Gilgul. How does he now rectify that? He rectifies that by two things. First of all, he rectifies that by being the father-in-law of Moses and giving back the twin sister, who is now his daughter. But Zipporah, the daughter of Yitro, who he gives to Moshe Rabbeinu to marry as a wife, and now in the beginning of Parashat Yitro, he also brings her back to him. After he had sent her away, sent her back to her father. He brings her back. This is his rectification of killing Moshe Rabbeinu in the previous Gilgul as Hevel because of the twin sister, of the extra twin sister, who is Tzipora. How does he rectify the killing of his brother because of financial reasons? 
That's by his advice of how to properly construct a financial corporation, or even more than a financial corporation, a whole governing organization. How to properly construct Hilchot Dinim, because what it says, another thing, that when he went and he killed his brother, he lost faith totally in Din, let Din velet Dayan, is the expression in Chazal. He said that there is no judgment and there's no judge. And his tikkun, his rectification of that, was to give the proper system of judgment to the Jewish people. All right, so this is just once more background, uh, getting into who Yitro is. So Yitro was in his first Gilgul, he was Kayan. What does that word Kayan mean? Where does it come from, Kayan? How do I know that, that he has to do with, with business, Kayan? Because Kayan, when he was born, why was he given this name, Kayan? Chava Eve herself said, Kaniti Ishet Hashem. Kayan means kinyan, means possession, means purchasing. What's more, Yitro is the, his soul. The, the name reflects the, the root of his soul. His soul means to buy, to purchase. It means he has to do with business. What else does that word Kayan mean? It says that Kayan also means Kina. Kina is jealousy. Meaning that the most destructive force in an organization that has to do with Kinyan, that has to do with buying and selling and purchasing, which is all called Kinyan, what destroys an organization? Kina, jealousy between different elements within the organization. Chazal actually say in Pirkei Avot that there are three things that destroy a person and the idiom in, in our sages is take him out of the world means destroy him from reality which are kina, ta'ava and kavod jealousy and lust, passions and honor or seeking COVID, seeking a lot of honor that people should give me honor these are the three things which destroy rectified systems and situations so actually we're taught that one is inside the other. The most outer expression of negativity is jealousy. A little bit deeper, but within jealousy, is passion. And even deeper than that is this lost passion itself for honor. COVID. We're taught that jealousy itself is the negativity of all of the innate powers of the soul. What we learned about before, the mutabash nefesh, the netzach hod yesod. The innate powers are the victory and the thanksgiving and the foundation that we learned about before. The negative force that operates at that level, what does it mean innate? Innate means that it's a, it's a characteristic which is from the womb which is already acquired and present to a certain extent in the womb, before birth. That's what it means in the innate powers of Nehi. That's the Chod Yisot. means the most innate negativity is jealousy. Then, when the newborn begins to, to nurse, which is called Yenika, from that moment on, the jealousy itself matures to passion. This passion is the negative force at the level of the emotive, the three emotive powers, which is called murgash. Then when the person even becomes more mature, that very same negativity matures into a drive for COVID, for honor. Once more, it all begins innately as jealousy and then becomes passion and then becomes COVID. And these are the three things in this order as stated in Pirkei Avot that take a person out of the world, it means destroy his world, or destroy himself from his world. All right, so this was once more to, uh, to explain who Cain is.
the first murderer, either for financial reasons or for lost marital reasons, has to do with kinyan, has to do with kina. With kinyan is possession, purchasing, and kina is jealousy. Right, so now he comes back as Yitro in order to rectify himself, and he succeeds. Because in his present reincarnation as Yitro, he succeeds in rectifying himself. And that's through two things, through giving his own daughter back to Moshe Rabbeinu, and especially teaching the Jewish people how to judge properly, and how to create a system, a collective system of organization, a structure of, of rule and leadership that works. Once more, the two terms, that the, the, the present term that is used for this in business is called flat hierarchy. The term that we now want to use is democratic monarchy. All right, so he, ta he teaches Moshe Rabbeinu, now we'll look at the chart. He teaches him four different properties. Four different properties and four levels of leadership. Some commentaries say that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the four different properties and the four levels of leadership. What are the four levels? Officers or ministers of the thousands. Because if I have 600,000 Jewish males, so I mean, it means that I need 600 sarei alafim to lead the 600,000 people. Then there are sarei me'ot, the officers of the hundreds, and sarei hamishim, the officers of the fifty, and sarei asarot of the tens. So there are four different levels of leadership. And there are four, these four properties that Yitro says to Moshe Rabbeinu once more, you have to look with your holy eyes, your insight, your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, and see which people amongst the, the nation possess these four attributes. Of Which once more we have here, on the right we have the four letters of Hashem's name. As before we said that this four letter paradigm and four letter basic frame of reference is like father, mother, son, daughter. Yudke Vavke. As Svirot, it's Chochma Bina, the six Svirot of the heart, and Malhut. But it also corresponds to another basic concept and structure in Kabbalah, which are the worlds. There are four worlds. The world of emanation, which is a godly world. The world which corresponds to the Yud of Hashem's name is called Atzilut, emanation. What is the nature? What does it mean to, be, to live in that world? How would we feel if we were living now in the world of emanation? So we would feel encompassed with the light of Hashem, just as a, a, as a fish in water, to the extent that we would lose consciousness, self-consciousness, and just experience, just be aware of the light, the emanated light of Hashem. This world of Atzilut is often called in Kabbalah, Rishut HaYachid, the, domain, the private domain. The private domain means the domain, just like, as in Shabbat, there is a private domain and a public domain. The world of Atzilut is called the spiritual private domain meaning that it is, it is exclusively the domain of the single one. Blessed be he. And whoever is in that house, that private domain, is also only aware and conscious of the single one that resides therein. That is the world of Atzilut. Then come the three lower worlds, as they're called in Kabbalah. The world of creation is Bri'ah, the world of formation is Yitzhiran, the world of action is Asiya. All of them possess self-conscious beings. The world of Atilut does not possess self-conscious beings. All of these lower worlds possess either angels or other beings, which are, to a certain degree, where the higher you are, the less self-conscious. The lower you are, the more self-conscious. So basically, the flow of worlds is is relative, is a, me, is, is a meter, a measure of relative levels of self-consciousness. 
the higher you are, there's less. When you reach the world of Atsilut, there's no, no self-consciousness. The lower you are, the more self-consciousness. So once more, we have the world of Atsilut, emanation, then the world of Bria, which is creation. Creation it means something from nothing, ex nihilo. Then the world of formation. Formation means something from something. Reforming present created matter. Just giving matter a new form. Then the world of action is taking that newly formed matter, not newly created, but newly formed matter, and giving it its final polish, its final shikhlu. Once more, the creation means to create something from nothing, to create matter. It's a little bit resembles the total economic flow that was discussed before. It's not exactly, but there's a resemblance. Something from nothing is creation. Giving that, that yet unformed matter, form, general form, is formation. That's the next world. Giving that, gen that general form particular polish and the final touches, that's Asiya. That's the world of Asiya. Sometimes these four worlds are, ca are, ca are called in Kabbalah, Ayin, Yesh, Klau, Prat. Nothing, something, general, particular. The world of Atidut is often called Ayin, nothing. What does that mean? No separate self-consciousness. It doesn't mean that we can't be there. We can be there. Everything that exists below exists also in the world of Atidut. It's just that it's totally immersed in the light of the of, of God to the extent that it possesses no separate self-consciousness whatsoever. Then comes something from nothing. But that initial something is yet formless something. That's called Chomer Hiuli, matter without form. That's the world of creation. Formless something. Then comes the world of formation, which is the general form. A general form is like in philosophy, you talk of forms. Like the, the form can be a species. As if you have the species of lions, so the lion as a species, that is the lion that exists in the world of formation. In the world of formation, you have one general lion. When you come down into the world of action, you have a multitude of lions, each one with its own fine touches to it, with its own particular personality to it. That's called the world of Asiya. Right, so in Kabbalah we're taught that these four conditions and prerequisites that Yitro taught Moshe Rabbeinu to look for in the Jewish people correspond to these four worlds. And it's very, very interesting and deep to meditate upon these qualities. So now let's begin looking at it. First of all, we'll just read the words. The first one is Anshei Chayil. The very highest, the one that corresponds to Atzilut, is men of valor. Then comes the second one, Yirei Lukim, corresponding to Briah, the fearers of God. Then comes once more another category of men. The first one says men of valor, and Shechayo, who are God-fearers. Then comes once more the phrase, the idiom men, but what type of men? Men of truth, and Shechayot. And once more, another term, Sonei Batza, Sonei Betza, which are haters of fraud, or people that cannot be bribed, the different interpretation of Chazal as well, in our sages as well, a little bit explain presently. Now let's look at one interesting phenomenon. The, the, last, the first word of the last phrase, which is Sonei Betza, if you look at the word Sonei, you can see that it itself, Sonei means haters of, to hate. It, it itself is the permutation of the word Anshei which appears just above it. 
You see that? That Sune is a permutation of Anche, just written in a different order, a different form. And the word Anche appears twice, as we mentioned before. It appears as the first word, men of valor, and then appears as the, as the beginning of the third phrase, men of truth. Now, the first thing that we see in this structure, once more, there's meditating upon a structure before we yet begin to analyze them one by one. We very clearly see that since the word Anche is repeated twice, there are two pairs here. It's very clear from the structure that Anche, Chayel, goes together, or let's call it its feminine counterpart, is Yurei Elohim. Anche, Chayel, Yurei Elohim. Men of valor, God-fearers. How do I know, for instance, that the concept of God-fearer is actually a feminine concept? A feminine concept which is the feminine side of men of valor. Because in that very famous last chapter of Proverbs that we read before making Kiddush and Chavez, which is called Eshet Chaya, the woman of valor, we find that it concludes with Isha Yirat Hashem Hititala, that the the woman who is to be praised is the God-fearing woman. So we see that God-fearing this has to do with the epitome of woman and a woman who initially herself is called a woman of valor. With the very same phrase, chayol. So it's, once more, it's very clear here from the analysis, the meditation upon the order, that Yirei Elohim is the batizug, the feminine counterpart of Anshei Chayol, of men of valor. The same is true of the other two. The other two are so close in their simple meaning that it's almost a little bit hard to distinguish between them. What's the difference between being truthful and, be, and hating dishonesty? It seems as though they're both saying the same thing, just one the positive and the other the negative. One is to be honest, and the other is don't be dishonest. But obviously there must be more to that, more to them than just that. Nonetheless, we, it's clear that these two are a pair. Just like the first two are a pair, a male and a female, the second two are also a pair. That just as we said before, that the general form of Yudke Vavke is father-mother, son-daughter. The son-daughter themselves evolve into Chatan Kala. Just as we said at the beginning of the creation, the brother and the sister themselves marry. And then they become Chatan, the groom and the bride. So we have here two pairs. The fact that the last pair is a pair is what's indicated by that permutation that we noted just a moment ago, that Sonei itself is a permutation of Anche. All right, so this was just to give us uh, orientation into these four properties. That there are two, two pairs also is always the structure of Yud Kevavke. The higher pair is called Hanistarota Hashem Elokeinu. It's called the hidden pair, which is to God, which is for God. And the lower pair is called Vihaniglot. Vihaniglot is Vav, Hey, Vav, and K. Vihaniglot, the last two letters of Hashem's name are the revealed pair, which is Lano Ulevaneinu, to us and to our children. So that is very, very clear here. All right, now let's try to begin discussing them one by one. Anche Chayel, men of valor. And again, here the important uh, point is that, that these men of valor correspond to a state of just like wisdom, we call it selflessness, so the world of Atzidut is totally in a state of non-separateness, no self-consciousness. So why are the men of valor, why do they merit how? In virtue of what do they merit to be in the world of Atzidut? Now one more important point. These four characteristics were the instruction of Yitro to Moshe, look for these four properties. And on the base of these four properties appoint the ministers of the people. What, how does the Torah say, we just before we, we mentioned that, that Moshe Rabbeinu listened to his father-in-law and did just what he said to do. 
But how does the Torah relate to us who he picked? So it says in the continuation of the, of the chapter, by Yuchar Moshe, Mikol Yisrael and Sheikhayel. It says that Moshe Rabbeinu went on to choose, to select amongst all of the Jewish people, and Sheikh Hayo. And it doesn't mention any one of the other three characteristics. So once more, Yitro said, you have to look for these four different characteristics. But then when Moshe Rabbeinu listened to him and did what he, what he said, it doesn't mention the last three characteristics. It just says, on Sheikh Hayo. So what does that seem to imply? Many of the commentaries say that that implies that Anshei Chayel is an all-inclusive state. That this, as we said before, Yitro didn't even understand the depth of the things that he himself was saying. As we'll explain that a little bit more in the continuation. This is what it says in Hasidus. One of the things that he himself didn't fathom is how his top level is all-inclusive of all of the other levels. That if you are a man of valor, then as though automatically you possess fear of God and you're uh, truthful and you hate fraud and deceit and bribery. What, is, what does a man of valor mean? According to Rashi, who is the most classic of the commentaries, on the Bible. So Rashi says a very interesting thing, which is just a direct continuation of our first talk here today, that to be a man of valor, you have to be rich. Rashi says that men of valor, that this word ver chayel, and there are many, many examples of this throughout the Bible, that chayel means wealth. So on Sheikh chayel or ashirim. And then Rashi goes on to say something that we would have imagined to belong to the last category. The last category, which is haters of fraud, seems to imply also a person who's not going to be bribed. So Rashi says that characteristic, that property, about the very first highest level. He says that since they're rich, you can't bribe them. They can't be moved, they can't be swayed, they can't be influenced. Because they're rich. What does it mean to be rich? So again, there's another deep teaching of what richness gives a person. It gives you backbone and independence. To be rich is to be truly independent. That I am not able to be swayed by any negative force. Self-sufficiency. Right, so this is one thing that Rashi says. <coughs> What else is there about this property? So in, at the end, in Hasidot we're taught that this concept of chayel, once but the word chayel means many things. It means, and in very frequent examples in the Tanakh, it does mean wealth. But more than wealth, it means success. Not just wealth, monetary wealth, but it means a successful person. More than success, it means success based upon taking initiative. The word chayal also means a soldier in the army, chayal. A person that has a lot of drive and that has, has a lot of mesirot nefesh, of dedication. He's, he's even willing to give up his life for that in which he believes. That's why the best word in English is valor. The valor certainly uh, seems to, to correspond to a soldier, but a devoted soldier that's willing to, give, to, to devote and de dedicate himself and sacrifice himself even for what he believes in. There are two basic types of individuals in their innate self-security. One of the innate properties, which is netzach, is called, as we heard before, is called confidence. Confidence is a sense of security. Security, a person that feels sure and secure about his li himself and life in this world, it can be in one of two ways. It can either be active or passive. Passive security means that I trust. I trust in God that everything will be okay. Yeh 
everything will work out. That's very good. Everybody should have that sense that Yebeseder, Yetov, things will be, will get brighter, will get better. Tracht gut wird sein gut is the expression in Yiddish. Think positively, things will become positive as you think them to be. That concept of tracht gut wird sein gut, think positively, positive thinking, that's also a very big thing nowadays, positive thinking, that's called passive security. Bitachon savil. That's not men of valor, it's not even a woman of valor. It's a very positive thing. Everybody should have it. But that belongs actually to the second category of Yirei Elohim. But the first category here of Anshei Chayil is security and trust and confidence that promotes and motivates continuous initiative to do things and there is actually no difference in one's experience between my own power and God-given power. And I'm so at one with the fact that God is giving me power is, is flowing into me energy that my own standing up and taking initiative and ambition, there are, as we know, there are people that are ambitious in life. The people are not ambitious. It's a little bit similar to what we said before, that, that the, the lowest level of wealth was simply to be satisfied with what, what you have, without great ambitions. There are people who are ambitious, but all of their ambitions are self-centered, are total self-consciousness, just for myself. All of my ambitions are just for my own grandeur, to become bigger and greater and more honorable. The ultimate state of atzilut, of ammunition, is that a person is totally ambitious, but he's, it's totally not for himself. It's like a true shaliach of the Rebbe, a shaliach of a, a, a messenger, an emissary of Mashiach, that he is totally in action. But his, his power, he doesn't even have to think about it, it's obvious to him and clear that all of my power, all of my energy is being given to me. I'm an emissary. I'm all getting it, it's all flowing into me. But, but, but it's me, it's not, it's not out of me, it's in me. But when energy and power is in me and is recognized and, 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 and experienced as my own confidence in, in, in being able to get up and do things and to take initiative and to be ambitious in life, and when there's absolutely no difference between me and where it's coming from, that is the true state of Atzilut. That is, that is true selflessness. There's a very important, famous uh, interpretation of Hasidut of what, what wisdom means. This is actually the, the, uh, the basic point is from the Zohar HaKadosh. That wisdom, the word Chokhmah is read to be Koachma. When you invert the first two letters of Chokhmah, wisdom, it becomes Koach, power. And the second two letters are Ma. Ma is the word that Moshe Rabbeinu uses to express his own bitur, his own selflessness. He says, Venachtuma, we are what? We are nothing. So it says the Koach, the power to be nothing is Chokhmah. Sometimes it means the, the, the power to bear a new idea from nothing is Chokhmah. But the, in Hasidut, we're also taught that it, it, you can read that expression, that Chokhmah, wisdom, well, wisdom is selflessness, is insight. You can read that very expression, Chokhmah, as takifut habitul. This is the, the idiom in Hasidut. The power and strength of nothingness. Means that once more, what is it trying to say is that nothingness in Jewish thought and this is maybe one of the basic, basic distinctions between Jewish thought and philosophy and non-Jewish thought, is that Bito, which is nothingness, does not make you nothing. Which means does not just take you out of the scene and put yourself into a total state of passivity. Just the very direct antithesis of that. That the true sense of nothingness is being 
so active that there are, and so much energy flowing through you and being expressed by you that it's without a thought, without necessitating one eye wink of a thought, it's obvious that there's absolutely no difference between my power and God's power. And that's called the Jewish, the, the ultimate Jewish state of Bito, which once more is the general state of the world of Atzilut, which all of the world of Atzilut is identified with Chokhmah, but it's here the Netzach of Chokhmah, the Netzach of Atzilut. That is the property here of Anshei Chayil. Uh, I would like to keep the question, if you don't mind, just otherwise we'll just start with questions and answers. So if you allow us to finish, then then we'll be able to take questions. All right, another thing about Anshei Chayil, to say it in a slightly different, a slightly different angle, but it's related, is that Anshei Chayil are people with unlimited talents. Talented individuals. One of the ways of, of explaining just in simple English words these, these four concepts are that Anshei Chayal means talent just innate talent. And that is property number one, as we'll explain. Yirei Elohim means being conscientious, a very exacting, particular, conscientious person about his work, about his function, his task in the company. You say that you have a work who is so conscientious that he deserves a raise. He deserves to be put up in the company, to be made in control of many other workers, be due to his conscientiousness. That conscientiousness of the person, that he's, he's good and exacting, and he cares, he, he cares that things are done right, and he's very fearful lest things be done wrong in the company, that is the second prerequisite. That's called Yurei Elohim. The third prerequisite, Anshei Emet, as we said before, what is the difference between truth and hating fraud? So one of the ways that it explains is that a truthful person means is that he's truthful in his word. His word goes. Or in the, this is actually an expression from Chazal themselves, and Rashi also uses this in his literal commentary of the text. He says that Anshei Emet or Baalei Haftachan Bitachon, people that you can rely upon, reliability. I can rely upon him. It doesn't mean conscientiousness, but if he says something, I can rely and take his word that he's going to do what he says. He's going to do. So once more, the, mo the simplest English word for the Anshea Met, which here, was, here all of the translations that we've given on the chart are just the literal translations of the words. But the property, once more, in the simplest English word for Anshea Met is reliability. And the next word for the Sonei Beta is really honesty. You can be reliable and you need not necessarily be honest in your dealings. Maybe you can do except you can be bribed. But whatever you say, if you say to the briber that you do such and such, you really do it. But you'll keep to your word. A person can be truthful in his word and can be uh, not a great total hater of bribery, of fraud. So once more, the You can be an honest thief. So what are the four, these four uh, concepts? Once more, in the simplest uh, English terminology, they are talent, conscientiousness, 
reliability, and honesty. All right, now let's get back to the first one. This was just to, once more to orient ourselves. The first one, which is talent, what does that solve? What basic problem in organizations and business does that solve? There is a phenomenon, well-known phenomenon, that's discussed in many, many uh, different uh, business texts nowadays, that when you're talking about a corporation or a company that does promote people based upon achievement and success, that if a person succeeds at a lower level, so he's promoted, he's given a raise, not just a raise in salary, he's given a raise in position. He receives a higher position in the firm. And if he is successful in that higher position, then his reward is to be put up even more. So what happens, the person goes up, is promoted and promoted and promoted up and up until he comes to some position that he's no good at. Then what happens then? Then, you have, then you're in trouble. Because he was so successful, he's promoted in the company so high on the ladder and so high on the pyramid of the company that he is no longer able to function properly. Because he was successful and once more successful, once more successful, until he reaches such a high level that he's not, he's not fit for it. Now what happens if every, everybody is, this is a syndrome, a syndrome that once was a very, very recognized problematic syndrome in business, especially in any organization. It can be in the army, in the military, in any organization this is a, one of the basic problematic syndromes, that people are lifted up and up and up based upon success until they reach a state where they're no longer successful. Then you're, you have problems. You can't put them down. You can't put them back into a position that is fitting for him. So what, what is the solution to the problem? So the, bad, the worst solution to the problem is that you have, at that point when you recognize that I put him up and up until he's no good, I have to fire him. Pensia. Pension. He was, he was so put up high until he's reached a level that he can no longer function at that high level, so now it's time to, to quit. That's the, that's the worst possible alternative to this problem, solution to the problem. What is a better solution? The better solution is to build in to your the person who's doing the raising, who's doing the promoting from level to level, to make him so, himself so insightful, as Moshe Rabbeinu Batata Chizeh, that he recognizes to what level this person is fit. And then he puts him into his, the best possible position which is fitting for him, which he's qualified to, and he does not make the mistake initially of putting him into a position which is no good for which he is going to prove to just create a negative reaction. But that's also not, not, that's not an easy solution because who says that people, that people are insightful of Ruach HaKodesh like Moshe Rabbeinu to know just exactly what he's good for, what everybody is good for. And once more we see that this doesn't work so well. Nonetheless, this is a better solution than the first one, just having him quit. Spiritually, the first solution is hakna. If you've reached such a point that you no longer, you no longer function, and I am, let's say, that not just my boss knows that, but I myself recognize that. So my quitting the job is ultimate surrender and submission hakna. If one is fortunate enough to always be placed in a position that he is fitting for, even when he goes up and up in the ladder of the company, then that's called Havdalah. When a person is put into his proper place, that's called Havdalah. What can, that's separation. He's separated for the good. He's put in his good place, like Ezo Chacham Hamakirat Mekomo, who is wise, he who recognizes his place. 
So if he has that wisdom to recognize what place is good for him, that is, that's a very good theoretic solution, which corresponds to what we call before Havdalah. What can be a, a solution which is Hamtaka, which is sweetening? The solution which is sweetening, again, depends on special souls. That there is a person, but well, this is an ideal. There is an ideal state that one has so great be tool to the organization. This is actually the hope of the promotion. The uh, so great be tool that that qualifies himself inwardly to be talented and fitting to do anything. He is good at any, he's potentially good at anything. Means that he has unlimited, as it were, unlimited potential talents. Even though just before he was doing one function, if you put him into another position, which requires different prerequisites and different properties, he'll also be good at it. Are there such people? Do such people exist? People that are, that are good at anything. They do. Those people are called Anshei Chayel. That's what we were talking about before, that Anshei Chayel is a person that has total bitul, a total self selflessness, but all of his energy is directed purely for the, because of his belief in his self-sacrifice to the tachlis, the purpose of the organization, because he has total faith and total pleasure and total will in it. And that arouses or ignites in his soul also unlimited, an unlimited spectrum of potential talent lines. This is actually taught us in many Hasidic stories of great of tzaddikim, but tzaddikim is a person that has true devotion and mesirus nefesh for Am Yisrael, for the people of Israel, that even though he has one property which is predominant, and which lichora at first sight seems to be his function and his task in life, but if for one reason or another he's put it into another function, say because of lack of a person to fill that other function, just like it says in Pirkei Avot, makom she'en anashim ishtadeliot ish, if there is a function which is not filled, even though you don't think that you're the one for that function, but because it's not filled, volunteer yourself. Volunteer yourself and try to do something which you have no previous knowledge about. For instance, me talking about business or Professor Kalak talking about Kabbalah. So that is an expression of Anshei Chaya which is makom she'en anashim hishtadel liot ish. Once more, so what does that mean? That means pure, pure talent. Pure talent which derives from true bitul. That is the level of anshei chayo. Then comes so once more, what does this mean? It means that really if, there's, if you have found such individual Anshei Chayel, you really don't need anything else. That's why Moshe Rabbeinu, when he found these, these true Anshei Chayel, that's, he stopped at that. And he said, Baruch he himself surely said, Baruch Hashem, that I found Anshei Chayel to fill all of the positions. And if I found Anshei Chayel to fill all of the positions, it means that potentially these people can rise in the organization to the highest point, without limit. They can go up and up and up from Sarei, Asarot, from the ministers of the tens to the fifties, to the hundreds, to the thousands. Right now, to make it a little bit short, let's say, that was clear, that to be a God-fearer means that you're concerned, it's like your, the expression is you're afraid of making a mistake. You're super conscientious. That's your Atelokim. That you're super devoted. 
Now this also is bitul. To, why is a person super devoted? Also because he has bitul to the organization. What is the difference between the bitul of Anshei Chayel versus the bitul of Yurei Elohim? Anshei Chayel are the selfless ones. The ones whose bitul is expressed as power, as takifuta bitul. The Yurei Elohim are those that possess what is called bitul hayesh, that he has a certain degree of self-consciousness. He's always afraid of that causing him to stray away from the, from the straight, from the 100% straight path. That's called Yur'e Elohim, that is a God-fearer. He doesn't want to be led astray. He has, he knows, he experienced that I have a certain degree of self-consciousness. I want always to be mevatel that self-consciousness, to nullify that self-consciousness, and keeping myself on bearings on exact, direct bearings to do the right thing, not to do the wrong thing. That's Yurei Elohim. Now what is, what's more, that has to do with the world of Briah, because what is the world of Briah? A freshly created something that still, still has some memory of nothing. In the world of formation, there's no longer a memory of nothing, of being nothing. The world of creation is once more a freshly created something out of nothing that has some memory of nothing and would like to return to that state of nothing. That's why the world of Briah is called the world of return consciousness. In Kabbalah, the world of Briah, of creation, is the consciousness of the will to return back into the nothing, because once more it's a freshly created, yet formless something. As soon as the something receives a, a levush, a clothing, a form, it loses its memory of nothing. What does that mean, a clothing, a form? It means a self-image. So once more, what is the world of Bria? Another way to say it, the world of Bria is self a certain minimal degree of self-consciousness, but yet without self-image. When there is already self-image, then one has forgotten being nothing. But when there is just a certain degree of self, one still senses as some awareness of that primordial state of nothing, and one wishes to return to that state. And that, that level of bitul, which is called bitul ayesh, that is yurei lokim, the second prerequisite here. And once more, all of these things can be found in very practical, in a very practical sense, even though we're talking about high madrigot, high levels, but it can be very, very practical. As we said before, if you have a conscientious worker, that is yurei lokim. If you have a talented worker with initiative, that is Anshei Chayel. And obviously those Anshei Chayel, they're the top, they're your top, your top managers. And the second degree managers in the corporation are the conscientious people. The third degree managers are these Anshei Emet now. The, the truth will be what it means, so we said before, the truth here, this way it's explained by Rashi, means the reliable people. The people whose word is a word. What else does it mean? There's another explanation, which has to do with the topic that we'll talk about at the end of our seminar today, Amir Hashem, which is the topic of quality. Truth is identified in Kabbalah and Hasidut throughout with the concept quality. And Shei Emet, another way of reading it, are quality-minded people, quality-oriented people. They're not after quantity as being the ideal, as we'll explain at, great, at relatively great length in the continuation, but want and seek for quality. 
So those quality-minded people in the corporation, those are the third level of executives. <coughs> and as we said before, the last one here is Sunei Batsa, those who are the truly honest people who hate fraud. One of the interpretations here is that they even are not lustful for large sums of money themselves. They do not have passion for money. What does that mean? How does that reflect itself? It says that if they are taken to court over some money issue, they would rather just give it away than all of the trouble of going to court. In other words, they're not lustful to keep hold of their money if there is some issue, some legal issue at hand that maybe, maybe there's even one iota of a chance that it doesn't really belong to them. That they would just rather give it to whoever claims it and not make a, a legal issue out of it. Those are called the Sunei Vatsa. Now another very interesting thing we'll just say about here at the end about this last word. This word Betza has a, a few other meanings in Hebrew. But here it has a very, very negative meaning, that betza is fraud, deceit, bribery, theft, all kinds of bad, and any, almost any bad uh, monetary thing is called betza. What else does betza mean? Everybody who has some, uh, has heard about the uh, Mivtsoim, about campaigns of the Rebbe, so he knows that the word for a campaign is a mivtsa, from the word betza. This very same word that means fraud, means going out and campaigning. Mivtsa tefillin, mivtsa mezuzah, mivtsa mashiach. What else does this word betza mean? It means bitsua. Actually, one of, the, one of the topics that's studied in economics that actually Professor College is, that's really his department, is called Chaker Bitsuim. What's the term in English? Operation. 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 Operation Research. In Hebrew, Chaker Bitsuim. Right, so obviously that Chaker Bitsuim is from the word Mivtza. It's like a campaign. But the word bitsua in the Torah and the Talmud has another implication to it. It means making a compromise. To compromise between two rival parties is called bitsua. Because bitsua, this is explained in the beginning of Masechet Sanhedrin, is, an, is a synonym for pshara. Mitzvah liftsua. When you can make a compromise, that is mitkabel al dat shneha ba'alei din, some a compromise which is acceptable by the two rivals, that is preferable than cutting the law in accordance with the letter of the law. That's called a mivtza. The idiom for that is mivtza liftsua. So what, is, what does this teach us? Before we explain what this teaches us, there's another thing it says in Kabbalah, that this word betza, which once more out here in this context is most negative, has such a high spiritual source to it that it is indicated and hinted at and alluded to in the names of the three patriarchs. And if you write on the board, Abraham Yitzchak Yaakov, <coughs> so if you look at the second letter of each one in that order, then you see that it creates the word Betza. So this word Betza, this is a holy name in Kabbalah that derives from 
the second letters of the of our forefathers, of our patriarchs. So it's it must be a very, very high high source, which falls very low. So let's just say in, in short that the way to overcome at the very simplest level, the way to overcome all of the negativity of fraud and theft and bribery, v'chula, v'chula, etc., etc., which is to reach, to attain honesty, is by becoming devoted to the campaigns or the chaker bitzuim, the mivtsaim of our patriarchs, to become a emissary of our patriarchs, to do the mivtsaim. What are the three mivtsaim of our patriarchs? Torah, Avodah, Gemilut Chasadim, the three pillars that the world stands on. Yaakov Avinu is the pillar of Torah, and Yitzchak Avinu is the pillar of Avodah. Of, of Torah, we all know what Torah means, is learning Torah. Avodah means service of Hashem, which in the time of the Temple means sacrifice. Nowadays it means prayer, praying to God. And Abraham is Gemilut Chasadim, which means doing acts of kindness. So in all, this is all that the world in the world of action that the way to overcome betza if you really hate betza the way to overcome it is to be to do these three mifzaim mifza of torah and the mifza of avodah and the mifza of gemilot chasadim and also that allows you to reach a level ultimately which is higher even than the letter of the law so what does this mean as far as Anshe and Matt? That there's something in the Sunei Betza that its tikkun, its ultimate tikkun, is to reach a level that you can use that power of the exception to the rule being higher than the rule itself. That sometimes you can create a situation in reality, which once more is a very important property, that you're, since reality has its, its innate problematics to it, and it does not always reflect, at least at first sight, the letter of the law. A person has to know how to create Torah-founded compromises. Without chas uh, v'shalom compromising the Torah, as the Rebbe always used to say. But to compromise factors, rival factors in the physical world, what's more, the physical world is that world which has the most rivals to it. In the higher world, you don't have rivals. It's rivals and, 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 uh, and fighting is what goes on in this lower world. And here you have to have the special property. These are the Sarei Asarot, the ministers of the tens, the lowest ministers. But you have to have this special property of knowing how to work out actual situations, like on, in the plant problems. That has to do with betza, with chikar bitzuim, and with the three mivtsaim of the three patriarchs, Torah, Abu Dagim, Lul Chasim. So with this, we'll, we'll conclude this, this session of the four conditions of leadership that Yitro taught Moshe Rabbeinu. And Moshe Rabbeinu understood even deeper than Yitro fathomed.